Valerian was the last living creature to have seen old Valeria before the doom. Valerian the Black Dread Origins, the greatest Targaryen dragon in history explored. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Terry and this is Marvelous Videos. There are tons of mythological creatures that we wish had existed, like unicorns and griffins for example, but the one fictional beast none of us can seem to resist is a fire-breathing dragon. Seriously, go to any corner of entertainment today and you'll find at least one dragon that can be a candidate for best dragon ever. Anime has got Shenron, video games have Dark Eater, and with House of the Dragon we're about to get a buffet of dragons to pick and choose from for that honorary distinction. But if you ask us, and George R. R. Martin, which dragon we would love to ride, the answer will probably be Balerion the Black Dread. Arguably the most famous dragon in the history of fantasy, Balerion's mythos is as rich as it's steep, and it's a damn shame that the only thing that we can see of him in House of the Dragon is his book Accurate Black Skull. Thank you Ryan and Miguel. But a dragon called the Black Dread must have gotten up to some pretty, well, dreadful things in his lifetime. And indeed, that is what we're here to discover. So, without further ado, this is the origins of Balerion the Black Dread, explored. This video is sponsored by Babbel, one of the top language learning apps in the world. In this area of globalization, I have often felt the need to sharpen my skills in some foreign languages, especially before my trip to Germany. I was anxious that I wouldn't have enough time to enhance my command over the German language. This is when I was introduced to Babbel, and the 10 minute interactive lessons were extremely helpful. It helped me brush up on practical conversations, and also saved valuable time. The award winning technology used by Babbel has been scientifically proven to help people learn new languages in just three weeks and real language teachers make it a lot easier to understand. This app is also very simple to use on your phone and compatible with all kinds of devices. Their 20 day money back guarantee makes it a lucrative deal and do let us know which language you would like to learn and why. Check out the link in the description to get 65% off your subscription and start learning a new language today because learning new languages can open up doors that you never knew existed. Tschüss und pass auf dich auf. Goodbye and take care. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Now let's begin. Etymology, Birthplace and Early Years if you pay close attention to the names of certain dragons, you can tell whether they are Westerosi acclimated Targaryens or true beholders of the blood of the dragon. Beleriand's name itself eschewed his hallowed history. Beleriand was named after a Valyrian god of the same name. Next to nothing is known about the enigmatic gods of the Valyrians because the Freehold practiced polytheism and allowed the worship of a hundred different gods in their lands. Their own personal gods never took center stage in their massive empire, and Meisters speculate that the reason for this was fostering religious strife between their subjects. By not claiming a single god or religion as the central pillar of their governance, they escaped the need to adhere to a set code whilst appearing almost liberal in a sense, which is far from the truth because the Valyrians adopted slavery from old geese, but also intentionally shrouded their own customs and rituals to prevent the secret of their powers from leaking to the other races. The Valyrians often thought of themselves as gods as well, especially those who were dragon riders, so it's possible that Valyrian is just the name of some prominent dragon lord from eons ago, but that's a matter of speculation left best to the Meisters. What can't be disputed is Balerion's birthplace, because by the time of the conquest, the Black Dread was the only living creature to have seen Valyria in its prime. Balerion was born in Valyria himself, after all, and spent his formative years in that mighty city bonded to one of the ancestors of Aegon Targaryen. After Lord Aenar Targaryen sold all his holdings in Valyria and the lands of the Long Summer and moved to Dragon Stone in 114 AC with all his possessions and five dragons, Balerion quickly became the only one to have survived the doom of Valyria. Already a young dragon by this point, though Balerion was a male dragon, his sex didn't bother the Targaryens too much because of the four other dragons they had brought with them all had laid clutches of eggs at Dragonstone. So although Balerion had become a sole survivor of sorts at a young age, he wouldn't have to spend his life in quiet solitude. He would be joined later in his life by the she-dragons Vega and Meraxes, and it's said that Balerion mated with both of them just as his rider would go on to do. 
Getting claimed by Aegon Targaryen and early military exploits, Balerion in the field. Though it's possible that Balerion had other riders during the years following the Doom of Valyria that came to be known as the Century of Blood in the East, the one thing that can't be disputed is the fact that he only became a prominent player after getting claimed by our favourite conqueror. Lord Aegon Targaryen, a descendant of Aenar and Daenys the Dreamer, mounted Balerion towards the end of the Century of Blood. We know this to be true because Volantis is said to have ruled over Mir and Lys for at least two generations, and Aegon is Aenar's great-great-great-great-grandson, so do the math and it'll make sense, trust me. Anyway, so far, the Targaryens hadn't involved themselves with the matters of the East, preferring to rule over the skies of their brooding island fortress and strengthening their ties with the remaining families of Valyrian blood that had taken up residence near Dragonstone. But when the Magisters of Tyrosh and the Prince of Pentos approached him with the offer of forming a grand alliance against the Tigers of Volantis, Aegon agreed and mounted Balerion for battle for the first time in recorded history. He flew his dragon southeastward, where a Volantine army was attempting to retake Lys following a rebellion in the Free City. Aegon burned the fleets of the self-proclaimed true daughter of Valyria, and his actions helped end the aggressive expansionist policies of the Tigers of Volantis. Balerion would never again be involved with an eastern conflict, but he would visit Essos time and again. His true military exploits, after all, lay in the West. Following the resolution of the conflict in the disputed lands, Lord Aegon Targaryen, along with his sister wives Visenya and Rhaenys, decided to conquer the continent the Targaryens had been avoiding for over a century. After gathering up swords and support from the houses that they had developed deep ties with during their residency on Dragonstone, chiefly House Valerian, Aegon and his sisters landed at the mouth of the Blackwater Rush and began construction of the Aegon Fort, in what marked the beginning of the Conqueror's invasion. The castles of houses Stokeworth and Rosby were close to where Aegon had built his fort, and once they caught sight of his sister's dragons, they were quick to submit to their would-be ruler. Aegon's first test came when House Mouton of Maidenpool and House Darklin of Duskendale formed an alliance to end Aegon's conquest before it began in earnest. Altogether, both sides were said to be fairly evenly matched on the field, with 3,000 troops each, though some sources claim Aegon only had a few hundred soldiers with him instead of a substantial 3,000. None of that mattered though, because the Conqueror had something none of the Lords of the Crownlands had an answer for. He had Balerion. Aegon mounted his dragon during his first test and showed the Westerosi houses the might of the dragon, ostensibly burning Lords Mouton and Darklin alongside many of their fighting men. Their descendants yielded their castles to House Targaryen shortly after, and Aegon was crowned for the first time as King of all Westeros and shield of his people. Aegon's first true test came when he went up against the forces of King Harren Hor, the ruler of the Iron Islands and the Riverlands. Meeting on the southern shore of the God's Eye, the Targaryen forces were able to repel an attack launched by Hor's men, but they would retaliate by crossing the sacred lake with muffled oars and killing many of Aegon's men with deceitful tactics. Once Aegon became aware of what had happened, he used Balerion to kill two of Harren's sons, who had launched the attack to take the dragon unawares, and prepared for a showdown that would earn Balerion his nickname. The Burning of Harren Hall, How Balerion Became the Black Dread We think it's appropriate at this point to give you a description of this legendary fire-breathing creature. Dragons are known to be majestic, beautiful, unique creatures with no two looking like the other, but even amongst their ilk, Balerion was truly a singular existence. He was pitch black in colouring, wings, scales and fire included, but his crest and claw eyes were a bright scarlet, and when he shot out his jet of fiery black flame, it was always shot through with red. Balerion, even before the conquest, had been a massive beast. His teeth were as large and sharp as swords, and his wingspan was so huge he could cloak entire towns in his shadow. For context, the average medieval town was about 640 acres, and George R. R. Martin likes to make things bigger on principle almost, so it's safe to say that Balerion's shadow fell on the earth for literally miles. His presence was usually enough to scare other lords into submission, but even after losing two sons, it seemed like King Harren Hall was determined to not give in to Aegon's rule. He'd spent 40 years building the greatest castle in Westerosi history, Harren Hall, but on the day its construction was completed, Aegon landed at the mouth of the Blackwater Rush, 
and presumably dashed Harren's dreams of becoming the first High King of Westeros. Even after facing a rebellion from the Riverlords that were supposed to be under his command, Harren remained defiant when Aegon came to parley with him and ignored Aegon's threat which said his line would end by stating stone does not melt and locking himself up within the thick walls of Harrenhal. It said Black Harren offered a fat reward to any man that could kill Beleriand in the siege and battle that were to come, but he took Aegon's threat a bit too lightly. That night, Aegon Targaryen mounted Balerion and flew high into the skies over the god's eye so as to avoid being detected by Harren's lookouts. He rose so high that it said Balerion looked like nothing more than a fly on the moon. Aegon then bade his mount to descend right within Black Harren's walls, and once Balerion had reached close enough, he unleashed his black flame and didn't hold back his fury. It's said that Harren Hall had been the best castle to have ever been built in Westeros, period. Its walls were so thick and high that a siege would most definitely fail to breach it, but Harren the Black clearly failed to accommodate flying dragons into his designs. Balerion's fire burned so hot that everything flammable within Harren Hall went up in flames at once, and its five stone towers cracked open and began melting like candles. By the time he was finished, House Hall was extinct, and Harren Hall was a blasted ruin, said to be cursed till the present day. From that moment onward, Balerion was known as the Black Dread. The Field of Fire and Forging the Iron Throne Balerion the Black Deterrent After the burning of Harrenhal, the only other time Balerion would be used during Aegon's conquest would be during the Field of Fire, where all three Targaryen dragons took flight for battle for the first and only time. Balerion, Vhagar and Meraxes burned 4,000 soldiers from the combined forces of King Loren Lannister and King Myrne Gardiner, whilst inflicting burn wounds on 10,000 more. All things told, the Targaryens suffered minor losses, while the King of the Rock barely survived the flames, and House Gardener met its end within them. Following the Field of Fire, Aegon took Balerion to Old Town and was officially crowned as the King of the Andals, Rhoynar and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm. He rode through Old Town on the Black Dread's back, and thereafter Balerion's role shifted from being an assault weapon to being a deterrent as well. Because although the Seven Kingdoms had been united by Aegon's conquest, they were in the nascent stages of accepting Targaryen rule, and civil wars could break out at any moment if the Crown didn't make substantial efforts to preserve and enforce their rule. So, two years after his official coronation, Aegon flew Balerion to the Iron Islands and landed on Great Week to solve the succession problem of the Maritime Kingdom. He didn't grant leadership of the Iron Men to one of his own followers, however, allowing them to choose their own leader, and they picked the Lord Reaper of Pike, Vicon Greyjoy. Thereafter, House Greyjoy remained loyal to the Targaryens as long as their dragons roamed the skies. They would send their longships to defend Aegon's western coastline, and even sent the head of a pretender king to his son's council following Aegon's death. After the resolution of the succession of the Iron Islands, Aegon would often conduct royal progresses throughout the Seven Kingdoms, taking one of his wives with him whilst the other held court at the Aegon Fort. During these progresses, the sight of Balerion kept Aegon's new lords in check, and he used the swords he had gathered from them to create the most enduring symbol of Targaryen rule in Westeros. It's said that the Iron Throne was forged with a thousand blades of Aegon's enemies, tempered with the fiery breath of the Black Dread, but historians claim that the seat was built by armourers instead. Either way, Balerion became a symbol of Aegon's right to rule over Westeros, and also acted as a heavy-handed peace-ensuring measure. But that wasn't the end of his days of burning enemies to ash, because Aegon's conquest wasn't over yet. Having taken control of all the territory north of the Boneway, Aegon focused his attention towards Dawn, intent on completing his conquest but he was met with resistance like no other. And it was in the years following this Dornish resistance that Balerion would truly earn his style as the Black Dread. The Wrath of the Dragons Balerion's Many Burnings In 4 AC, the Targaryens launched a full-scale invasion of Dawn, and Aegon didn't use Balerion in the conflict at first. He opted to conquer Dawn using conventional military strategy, but ended up paying the price when the Dornish used bloody guerrilla tactics to exact heavy losses. Even though Aegon had flown Balerion to Sunspear and put the abandoned castle and all of Dawn under the clemency of the Iron Throne to finally complete his conquest, 
He was met with rebellion as soon as he and Rhaenys returned to King's Landing. After his Hand of the King and half-brother Oris Baratheon was mutilated by the Vile of Vile, and several of his supporters and their men were tortured and given gruesome deaths, Aegon finally gave in to his grief and loose Balerion upon the Dornish. The king burned the keeps of House Wheel in the Boneway and turned the sands near Sandstone, Vaith and Hellholt into glass alongside Visenya and her dragon Vagar. When the Dornish refused to join his rule, Aegon burned every castle in Dawn from Balerion's back, save Sunspear, at least twice over the course of two years that came to be known as the Dragon's Wrath. Balerion's burning of Dawn would only cease in 13 AC, when Aegon and Nymor Martell signed a peace treaty to bring the conflict between Dawn and the Iron Throne to an end. He would remain Aegon's mountain companion until the Conqueror's death, after which Balerion didn't light up his rider's funeral pyre, for he had been claimed by another. Maegor, Aegon's son through Visenya, had been waiting for his father to pass so he could claim Balerion, because he thought the Black Dread to be the only dragon worthy enough of becoming his mount. When Jonas Arryn of the Vale defied Maegor's brother King Aenys, he flew Balerion to the Eyrie to put down the rebellion. Though Balerion's flames weren't loosed upon the traitor Arryn and his supporters, they were all hanged by command of Prince Maegor. When Maegor was commanded to go into exile for five years by his brother King Aenys, he took Balerion with him, and when he returned, he brought fire and blood to the Faith of the Seven. This was because the Faith didn't approve of ancient Valyrian customs, such as incest and polygamy, and had only kept silent about Aegon's abominations due to his immense power as a politician. Seeing that the son was not the father, the Faith rose up in rebellion during the reign of Aegon's son Aenys, and when Maegor usurped his brother's throne, he meted out a brand of justice that earned him the nickname Maegor the Cruel. After surviving a harrowing trial by Seven and awaking from a 30-day coma, Maegor mounted Balerion and burned the Sept of Remembrance, the base of the Faith Militant's elite wing, to the ground with no warning whatsoever. All those who tried to flee the Sept were shot down by Maegor's archers and crossbowmen. He used the Black Dread multiple times in his war with the Faith, burning poor fellows and warrior sons and the retainers of rebel lords alike during the battle at the Great Fork of the Blackwater Rush. Maegor would use Balerion to burn the seats of houses Lorch, Doggett, Falwell and Broom as well as those other pious lords in the Westerlands, while his mother did the same in the Riverlands with Vagar. Maegor even threatened to burn the Starry Sept at Old Town, the centre of the Faith of the Seven, if they kept up with their pious denouncements of the Way of the Dragon. But the city was spared Balerion's flames thanks to a change in leadership. Maegor would also use Balerion to commit one of the worst acts in Westerosi custom. When his nephew Aegon decided to press his claim despite his uncle's clear stranglehold on the Iron Throne, Maegor decided to make an example of him. Prince Aegon marched towards King's Landing from Pink Maiden with nearly 15,000 men, riding atop his dragon, Quicksilver. But when Maegor and Balerion showed up in the skies, Aegon's side knew the fight was lost before it ever even began. Balerion was at least five times the size of Quicksilver and battle-hardened besides. He swooped down on the younger dragon in the battle beneath the god's eye and killed both dragon and rider, thereafter earning Maegor the unenviable tag of Kinslayer. When construction on the dragon pit was completed, Balerion was the first dragon to be housed within its walls. However, that wouldn't be for another eight years as after Maegor's death, the Black Dread simply returned to Dragonstone and laired in the Dragonmont until someone else tried to claim him. Throughout a great chunk of his known life, Balerion was ridden by two warriors of unmatched repute, but the effects of their actions could not have been more different. Where Aegon Targaryen unified seven kingdoms with Balerion's fiery breath, Maegor nearly undid it all in his blood-soaked war with the Faith but both conflicts would end up reinforcing the sheer terror of the Black Dread, and even in his old age, Balerion was known to be a willful beast. When King J. Harris ascended the throne, he would often advise his counsellors and dragon keepers to not disturb Balerion, as he was not a beast to be trifled with. For over half a decade, Balerion would reside at Dragonstone before being claimed for the final two times by the unlikeliest of riders. A trip back home and life in a dome, the final years of the Black Dread. In 54 AC, when he was over a century and a half old, Balerion found an unlikely rider in the form of Crown Princess Aria Targaryen. She was only 12 years old when she approached the dragon to claim him, 
and it was perhaps that very fact that made it a huge mistake for the young girl. Remember when we called Balerion willful? Well, if you claim a dragon and can't overpower its will using your own, then the dragon will be the one making decisions whilst flying, not you. And it appears that's exactly what happened, because the young Aria disappeared shortly after claiming the Black Dread towards the end of 54 AC. Balerion was not spotted anywhere in Westeros, even after Aria's mother went looking for him on her dragon Dreamfire, there were reports coming in from Essos that stated the presence of a dragon as far as the fighting pits of Meereen, but King J. Harris's council never paid too much attention to those stories. For over a year, the search for Aria Targaryen continued, before one day in 56 AC, the Black Dread flew into King's Landing in what is perhaps the grimmest scene from Fire and Blood. Princess Aria Targaryen looked like someone had charred her to the bone, she was stick-thin, disheveled, and running a fever that had apparently burst all the blood vessels in her eyes. After dismounting Balerion, the only thing she could say was, I never, before she collapsed. As for the dragon himself, something had happened to Balerion which, if leaked to the general populace, would end up threatening Targaryen power for time immemorial. The Black Dread hadn't just been hurt, he had been deeply wounded by something that left a nine feet jagged rent in his left side that was still smoking and dripping with hot blood. This was a problem for the Targaryens because up until that point, Beleriand had been a nigh invulnerable sign of strength and stability for their dynasty. Countless wars and a recorded dragon fight didn't leave as much as a scratch on him, and yet here he was, with multiple half-healed scars and a wound taller than Yao Ming. Sept and Bath conjectured that since Aria could not bend Beleriand to her will, the Black Dread took her to his birthplace instead, implying Beleriand went to Valyria with a princess on his back. And based on the account of Aria's death that Sept and Bath gives us, we're inclined to believe him as well. But the fact remains that after this fateful flight, Beleriand the Black Dread would spend the rest of his life in the Dragon Pit at King's Landing. It's said that if a dragon is fed and given enough space, it'll never stop growing, and yet Balerion did stop growing in 93 AC. At the peak of his size, he had been big enough to swallow a woolly mammoth whole, and at the peak of his strength, he was said to have been able to devour aurochs like lemon cakes. Now in his old age, Balerion became moody and extremely slow, to the point that he wouldn't even retaliate if harmed. In the year 75 AC, Prince Balon Targaryen, J. Harris's second heir, smacked Balerion's snout when he entered the dragon pit to claim a dragon for himself and lived to tell the tale. His lady wife was also advised to not mount the Black Dread by the Dragon Keepers given his advanced age, but that wouldn't stop their son Viserys from claiming Balerion for his mount in 93 AC. By this time, the Black Dread had stopped growing as we've already mentioned, and was infinitesimally slow to rise. Viserys had to struggle to get Balerion off the ground, and only circle King's Landing on his back thrice before landing him at the pit again, fearing his frail body wouldn't be able to fly Viserys to Dragonstone. Balerion would pass away the very next year in 94 AC, and would be the only Targaryen dragon from Aegon's day to have died of old age. Our histories. They tell us that Aegon looked across the Blackwater from Dragonstone. Legacy of the Black Dread At the time of his death, Balerion had easily counted more than 210 years in this world, making him the oldest known living dragon in Westerosi history and beyond. He had built a reputation as being a fierce and independent dragon who only obeyed riders that were as willful as he was. Balerion was unanimously considered to be one of the biggest reasons for Aegon's mostly successful conquest and unification of Westeros, to the point that he is still spoken of with high regard even by the people whose ancestors he probably directly had a hand in burning. After his death, Balerion's skull was the largest one kept on display in the throne room of the Red Keep. It was taken down only when Robert Baratheon became the King of Westeros, at which point the skull was relocated to the dungeons and cellars of the Red Keep, where Arya Stark found it whilst chasing cats. Although Balerion is no longer around in person, he has been reborn in spirit as Daenerys' black dragon Drogon, whom her blood rider Ago calls Balerion come again. Indeed, Drogon's colouring and temperament seem to imitate the Black Dreads in more than one way, and unless George finishes writing his stories, we can't say whether Drogon will become as famous, or infamous based on your understanding, as his ancient Valyrian counterpart. Daenerys also named the ship after the Black Dread during her voyage from Quarth, 
to the cities of Slaver's Bay as a way to tell the world that the dragons had returned for fire and blood. House of the Dragon has taken out a significant chunk of Beleriand's final years because in the series truncated timeline, Aria Targaryen does not exist, which takes out the possibility of Beleriand ever returning to Valyria, but that is the only major difference to his story made in the show. Other than that, he's treated with literal reverence as you can see his skull resting upon an altar when Viserys names Rhaenyra his heiress. If you take the ending of Game of Thrones Season 8 seriously, then it's possible that Drogon followed in Beleriand's footsteps and took Daenerys' dead body to Valyria, or that one place in the Dothraki Sea where he was hatched, to be more precise, and that would be a very neat tying up of events from a narrative point of view. And if you don't, then one, thank you, and two, we're sorry because it's highly unlikely that we're going to get to see Beleriand as anything but a skull cinematically. But that's fine by us because it preserves his legend. Beleriand the Black Dread was one of the most dangerous and recognisable dragons that the known world had ever seen, and his death was perhaps the most deserved one in the books. Well, if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.